I think it's great that we are um, beginning in all of our circles or many of our circles around the nation to acknowledge what the real history is. And I'm delighted to be a part of that. Um, I also, you know, find it very valuable to be able to talk about my experiences actually in both places. Of all the places I've lived, all the places I've visited, New Haven and Savannah are very special to me. I didn't always understand or value uh, those places. I think I perhaps valued New Haven more than I valued my own upbringing in Savannah, but I have learned um, the beauty of each place. And also I've learned a lot about how they're connected. That's what I want to share today. I also want to point out that because of my development and evolution over time, I've also learned of how important it is based on the position that you're in to help children, to help adults and others who are visiting to your community learn the real history. It is certainly helpful to have that tapestry full of the colors and the vibrancy that actually makes it what it is. So I'm happy to share today about how Savannah, Georgia is a living room to history. And I would also advance the position that New Haven was a living room to history for me too. While I have a limited amount of time today, I can just tell you that just in even putting this together, I kept running out of time. I kept practicing and thinking, wow, I only have like 25 minutes. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to get everything in. So I did choose very carefully the things that I wanted to highlight today. For those who are familiar with um, Savannah, you do know that it is um, a tourism a location. And when people come to our city, they usually are looking for the general things like Savannah's uh, birthplace for Julia Gordon Lowe, the founder of the Girl Scouts. We have thousands and thousands of Girl Scouts coming to the city every year to experience the birthplace and all of the things that are associated with our Girl Scouts. We have lots of people who come uh, to visit Tybee Island, formerly called Savannah Beach. Um, it is, of course, the beachfront area for our area and it has a lot of history, some very um, popular and people enjoy it. And there's some of it that's very, very painful that we are evolving through. Um, most people like to come and experience the historic district. Um, it is the largest uh, national landmark district in the United States. And of, of course, lots of people like to come for the food. Um, it is the home of Paula Dean, and lots and lots of people come for Paula Dean food. Now, lots of local people don't necessarily do that, but lots of people come from outside the city and uh, enjoy Paula Dean. So those are the, some of the things that Savannah is known for. The same way people come to New Haven, uh, myself included from the very beginning, to enjoy and explore the Yale campus. As people get to know the city more, they may spend a lot of time over at the Grove Street uh, Cemetery. We all enjoy the New Haven Green. We all certainly enjoy the Schubert Theater. We are cognizant of Center Church and what it means. And then of course, we all enjoy pizza. And then of course, we all enjoy hamburgers. So each of our cities, each of these two cities that I love have special places in my heart. And today I will talk about Savannah, how it is the living room to history, make some important points about that, but also evolve into showing you how Savannah and New Haven are connected. Michael has graciously agreed to be my um, driver, my Vanna or my van for today. So Michael, I'm ready for the next slide.
So when I look at uh, my role as an educator, both formal and informal, I think it's important for us in this period of acknowledging that we do not always get the full story to look at Savannah as a living room to history. There are great uh, segments that we will cover just briefly today. It is the home of historic architecture, much like New Haven, squares and parks, lots of cultural heritage to celebrate, has a rich maritime history, Civil War legacy, a literacy legacy as well. There are definitely deep roots in African-American history and certainly preservation efforts that are world known. So I want to make sure that I cover those points with you uh, today. Ready, Michael? So let's talk about the founding of Savannah. And when I say founding, I say that in jest because as we just acknowledged, Savannah was here already. It was actually already occupied uh, by the Yamaha Indians, uh, the, the Yamaha Native Americans. And it's really important to know that when we talk about recorded history, it means Savannah or um, American recorded history, it actually began in 1733. I've not been able to determine when the Yamaha Indians were in the city, but they were certainly here when James Oglethorpe uh, came over from England and brought his 120 English settlers with him on the good ship Anne. They landed on a bluff that was really right near where the Yamaha uh, tribe was at the time. And they decided, uh, Oglethorpe decided that he would name this area, Georgia, after King Edward. And uh, Savannah became its first city. It eventually became, once it became a state, it became the state's first capital. And it was always dubbed America's first planned city. And there'll be more about that later. Ready, Michael? Now, I do want to make a point that when Oglethorpe landed, he, um, a part of his 120 settlers was a, a man named Noble Jones. And what Noble Jones did was staked out the area and established a plantation called the Warmslow Plantation. Of course, today is called the Warmslow Historic Site. It is still operating. It uh, was about 500 acres. The Jones family uh, descendants still own that property. It is no longer used, of course, as a um, as a plantation, but it's important to note that that is still standing and still recognized as a part of Savannah's founding. So for us, the Yamaha uh, tribe was already there. They definitely could not be discounted and actually Oglethorpe worked with them so that there would be a peaceful settling of those 120 persons that came from England. Of course, Savannah's right on the water and from its beginnings, from the days of Oglethorpe, um, it became uh, very important to establish a kind of maritime industry. That culture still remains and can be seen all across the city. We have lighthouses everywhere, canals, much like New Haven, uh, statues and monuments all across the city. It is Georgia's largest port city and has, has been for the longest time. It became a waypoint for much of the cargo, including human cargo that came into the city and that would be shipped from the city around the world. In 1817, you will find if you come to visit Savannah, I hope you will, a place called the Factors Walk. It was the entryway into the city and the place of exchange of human cargo as well as rice, cotton, and other goods that were to be loaded onto and off of ships. And another really important point that I've come to learn is the SS Savannah was the first, um, was the operating port for a steamship SS Savannah. And it was named that because 
of the major um, benefactor or the major businessman associated with the SS Savannah, uh, William Scarborough. This was the first steamer to cross the Atlantic Ocean in 1819. I had no clue about that, that it was the first steamer. Now, it had its wreck in New York on its return, but they actually um, left Savannah for its first trial run and then made it across the Atlantic in a two-month period and then ended up, when it came back, um, it came back, of course, to New York and ended there. But I had no idea before uh, moving back to Savannah, actually, that the SS Savannah uh, was the first steamer to cross the Atlantic Ocean. And that happened in 1819. So something else to know about Savannah's maritime history. Savannah maintains its leadership in uh, maritime traffic. It is the third largest port in the United States. And it also is the largest port that has both um, access to waterways and rail. So it is really a significant part of Savannah history and also Savannah economics. If you are ever in the city, you will see those container ships coming through and we are now deepening the port to allow more of that cargo to come into the city. So Savannah's maritime history is very much like New Haven's and you will see more about that shortly. Ready, Michael? There are tangible connections to the past still evident in Savannah. You will learn that when Savannah was developed, it was developed on a grid, much like New Haven. New Haven was developed on what they call nine squares. Savannah was developed with an idea of 24 to 27 squares. Most of those squares are still operational. We have a large historic district and much like New Haven, we have a large green field right in the middle of the city. It's called Forsyth Park. You see the image there. You also saw that image in your reminder about uh, the program today. And both of those are really strong reminders of our past. Ready, Michael? You're hearing uh, pretty much as I'm going through lots of connections to what you also have in New Haven. In Savannah, we are celebrating it uh, actually next week again, the um, Owen Thomas House, which is a structure that was built, a house that was built and is the largest um, urban, largest standing um, structure that includes the urban enslaved quarters. Um, so we, if you have an opportunity to visit, you, visit it, you'll be intrigued to find much of that, those um, enslaved quarters still intact or memorialized um, for visitors to come and see what was it like to be an enslaved person working in a huge mansion in the city. We also have Bonaventure Cemetery, um, very much like Grove Street Cemetery that is the resting place for lots of significant contributors to the history of Savannah and the history of Georgia. And it is often the place where we invite students, much, much as we do in New Haven, to visit those places so that they can see the resting places and also make some connections between people that they study associated with the history of our state and our city and people that are um, whose families uh, sometimes are uh, resting in these locations. Ready to move, Michael? What's really important for us also is that we have for the longest time growing up in Savannah, I will just tell you that much of what the world is discovering about Savannah's history, I'm discovering as an adult. That's why it's so important for us to make sure that our children are learning the facts and not just what is convenient. We have had lots of conversation and lots of recognition in recent years of weeping time. It was the largest sale 
of enslaved individuals in Georgia history, frankly, in US history. 459 persons were sold. And right now in that large tract of land is a, a public school. So we, at the, as a part of our public school community, understand and help our children and our community learn about that, um, that sale. It is called weeping time because there was actually a weeping, a rainstorm, if you will, during the sale of those individuals. It is really something to read and to learn. Um, just be prepared for what it will do to you emotionally, but it will also charge you up to ensure that we do not let this um, idea of this sale, this history go unnoticed. Savannah is also the home of Special Field Order 15. If you've ever heard the term 40 acres and a mule, it was an order uh, signed by General Sherman, who eventually gave the city as a gift uh, to President Lincoln. Uh, President Lincoln approved spiel, uh, Special Field Order number 15, which said that every person of color, every enslaved person upon being freed would be given 40 acres and a mule. Now I can just tell you that that didn't happen. Uh, certainly it is referred to by many, but the place that that was actually signed is at Second Baptist Church on Green Square in Savannah. And Interestingly, Green Square is named after Nathaniel Green, and you'll hear a little bit about him um, going forward. Ready to move, Michael? So you can see why it's so difficult to like get it all in, but I did want to point out also, Savannah currently has like 1,400, maybe 1,200 churches. I do want to point out two of them that I think are really, really important for you to know. The um, First African Baptist Church is the oldest black church in North America. It is right here in Savannah. And frankly, it's right across the street from a, from a monument that recognizes the contribution of Haitians to the Savannah uh, history and Savannah community. It was organized in 1773. We also have as a part of our community, much like New Haven and other places, the Cathedral Basilica of St. John the Baptist, and its, it's uh, origins date back to 1796. So in a place that actually supported um, slavery, we had two churches and actually many, many more that were here to provide respite uh, to all citizens um, who wished to proclaim their um, their loyalty to Christianity and other communities. Now, what was interesting about the Cathedral Basilica is that upon the founding of Georgia, the founding of uh, Savannah, Roman Catholics were not allowed. But finally in 1796, they were allowed uh, to actually worship in public. And that is how the Basilica came to be. Ready to move, Michael? Savannah is also known for its historical uh, preservation. Many of the places that you will see in downtown Savannah are a part of the National Historic Landmark District. You'll recall that Savannah was built on a distinctive grid, much like New Haven, and that grid covers really about two point uh, about two miles. Those miles are definitely walkable and they contain more than the 20 squares that were originally uh, designed. Lots of museums, lots of churches, lots of mansions, but also some forts just a little farther out from the city and lots of revolutionary and civil war uh, places that are worth uh, studying. There are also cobblestone streets that have been here since the beginning. Lots of original ironwork done by many of the enslaved uh, Black folks in Savannah, but also many of the free 
Blacks who were living in Savannah. And there were there was a small community of free Blacks living in Savannah who had responsibility for the ironworks, manicuring the gardens, and of course, making sure that uh, the parks that are here were maintained by those beautiful oaks that are there. Next, Michael. That architecture, what we've learned is that more than 40% of the buildings and homes that are in Savannah have some architectural or historical significance. Um, the architecture here, you see those samples um, span 17th, 18th, 19th century, um, from simple colonials to gingerbread houses um, in the downtown area and some access of the Victorian period. There is um, are several examples of architecture that's available in our area. So many of the students studying architecture from Yale and other places um, have an opportunity to come here and see the various um, styles, federal, Georgian, Greek revival, everything. Almost any kind you want to see is here in Savannah. Ready to move, Michael? No, I'm trying to speed it up just a little bit. You will see it probably more um, in food than in other places in Savannah, but because of the um, enslaved people who were brought into our area and landing right here on our shores, many of them also in Charleston and also other coastal cities, their roots were in West Africa dating back to the 1700s. So when they came to our area, they came from areas that really specialized in uh, growing rice and grains. So they, when they came here, they were really brought here to work in the plantations so that we would be able to generate and compete in terms of rice production with South Carolina. They are definitely linked to fishing, crabbing, oystering, and all of those kinds of activities that are found um, near the river. Savannah is a seafood town, but lots of the dishes have West African uh, roots. And so when you come to Savannah, you'll find in restaurants at, at every level, from the very, very, very expensive to the, you know, my dive on the corner, you will find the Gullah Geechee roots um, most often playing itself out um, through our meals. Ready to move forward, Michael? We also have a very strong literary history, much like New Haven, but most people who come here are looking for Flannery O'Connor's birth home. It's also the home of Conrad Akins, who was a US poet, uh, poet laureate. He also won a Pulitzer Prize. What is not known uh, is that James Allen McPherson grew up here in Savannah. He was the first African-American to win a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. And then of course, everybody knows about Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, which was also associated with the Mercer House, which was also associated with Johnny Mercer. Now Johnny Mercer didn't grow up in that house, but certainly it was associated with his grandfather. And then the Williams story and the murder, all of that. Lots of people come to Savannah just to experience uh, those things as well. Ready to move, Michael? So here are the connections that I thought were really, really important. When we look at Savannah and New Haven, uh, so both settled by the English, um, the Puritans for um, New Haven in 1638, and Oglethorpe and his settlers in 1733. Both were part of the original 13 colonies. Both have a strong maritime history. Both places for the Underground Railroad. While Savannah was deeply engaged in um, the slavery of people, it was also a stop on the Underground Railroad. In fact, First African Baptist Church, the oldest in uh, North America, had special places and there were also houses in the historic district that were safe houses for persons who were trying to move north. New Haven, of course, 
also provided the same in terms of the Underground Railroad. And both cities also have a significant history in the civil rights movement, as Michael uh, mentioned when we started. Ready to move, Michael? Here are some notable New Haven connections in terms of persons. Uh, most who were a part of colonial uh, times, James Habersham, New Haven native, moved to Savannah, became a planter and a political leader. Uh, Jonathan Bryan was educated in New Haven. I think he was born in Wallingford. Educated in New Haven and moved to uh, Savannah and became a colonial leader as well. Lyman Hall attended Yale. He moved to Georgia as a physician, became a political leader, signed the Declaration of Independence. He was also governor of Georgia for a year and he helped to charter the University of Georgia. So he moved in and out and around uh, Savannah. He was in Liberty County, which is about 45 miles away, 45 minutes away, but then moved to Savannah um, during that time period based on a fire in his home community and stayed here for quite some time. And then of course the piece is probably known most widely in terms of connections is Eli Whitney. He attended Yale. He moved to Savannah, interestingly, to work as a tutor for the widow of Nathaniel Green, who was a revolutionary war hero at the Mulberry Grove Plantation. And of course, there are lots of stories about the, how the cotton gin was patented, but the, the fact that it happened there, he, holds, he held the patent to it. It did advance the growth of the cotton industry. I'm intrigued by the various theories about uh, Catherine Green, who was the widow that connected with him. It is a position that she financed it, that she actually developed it. We won't know by asking either of them, but certainly he is um, given credit for establishing the patent for it right here on Mulberry Grove Plantation, which is no longer operating, of course. It is a part of the Savannah um, ref, uh, Wildlife Refuge, and it is not occupied, so it's not a place that someone can go, but it's important to know that that indeed happened in Savannah, Georgia. Ready to move, Michael? What are some other notable similarities is that there was early African uh, presence in both cities. What I did learn when I was in New Haven was that some people were brought to the city as enslaved people while others were free. I also learned through my history and teaching children in Savannah that Blacks arrived in New Haven in 1638, as early as that time. In Georgia, slavery was outlawed from its beginning until about 1750, when growth in the rice plantations surged in South Carolina. So for South Carolina to stay, for Georgia to stay competitive, they decided then to ensure its labor force by making um, slavery a part of everyday life. I mentioned earlier that New Haven was laid out in 1638 as a grid known as the nine square plan. So there has been this long time conversation about whether New Haven was actually the first planned city in, in um, America. We um, discussed lately that New Haven had the opportunity to establish the first um, HBCU, Historically Black College or University, um, did not take advantage of that. Uh, Savannah State University was established in Savannah in 1890. And actually as the Georgia College for uh, colored youth. And um, it is the oldest institution of higher learning in Savannah. What's really interesting is people come to Savannah for SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design. People come from all over, but there are lots of people who actually come to Savannah State to stand on that sacred ground, which is right on the marsh, beautiful, and has graduated and have many, many uh, persons coming through who are now world leaders. We um, love to see New Haven Green and the Forsyth Park, Forsyth Park in Savannah. Both of them started as original military parade grounds. 
And they both are now dedicated for use uh, for public enjoyment. I see Worcester Square as um, compatible with Savannah's historic district. And I also see lots of similarities between Grove Street Cemetery and Laurel Grove Cemeteries and Bonaventure Cemeteries in Savannah. Now, what's interesting about Laurel Grove Cemetery is that there is a white part of the cemetery and there's a black part of the cemetery. I think I um, don't really understand why that is, but certainly we do know that there are parts of Savannah where only black folks can be buried and only white folks can be buried and others. That is changing, but lots of people come to the city to see who is buried in Laurel Grove North and Laurel Grove South. And uh, typically what we find is significant persons in the history of both cities are in um, those cemeteries that I named. Ready to go, Michael. And I think that is the last one. I tried to move quickly. Um, as you see, you know, Savannah and New Haven have lots and lots of connections that I think makes it dear, makes them both dear to me. But one of the things that we know is in this time period, it's really important for us to capitalize on what we are learning, maybe what we knew all the time, and making sure that we are first introducing those in our community, especially our children, to walkable places that allow them to see the full and rich tapestry, sometimes painful, sometimes joyful, but nonetheless, they need to know the real history. I am delighted to have lived and enjoyed both places, and I am delighted to continue to learn about the beauty and the history of both places. And I, I encourage people who've not gone out to understand that that history is a living room right there for them to learn from, but also to teach from. So thanks for letting me uh, share in this way. Thank you. And we have some time for conversation and question and answer. I've got a number of conversation prompts. Um, I think you laid out very well the sets of connections and you and I have talked about it uh, for the audience, uh, a number of us from community engagement at Beinecke and our colleague, Charles Warner, who you saw last week visited in Savannah. The next show that we have at Beinecke will feature the collections of the great American cultural organizer and collector, Walter Evans and his wife, Linda Evans. And so we'll have uh, some stuff that have been living in Savannah that's now here uh, the collections of the Evans collections of Walter, uh, Walter Evans collections of Frederick Douglass, James Baldwin, and Holly Harrington. Uh, the great work that we've heard about in a previous Mondays of Beinecke, William Grimes, such an important person in American history who liberated himself from Savannah. So there's so many of those, but I wanted to start to take you back and a little bit of your history. And if you could share the story of a place that you ended up being on the board of, the Telfair Museums, and the story of uh, when you went to uh, hear a lecture there when I think you were in middle school. But I wonder if you could take that, both tell the story and reflect some on your growth and how you use that story with uh, young people today. Uh, thank you for giving me that opportunity to tell that story. So somehow in my life, I have focused on uh, people like Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. I am like totally obsessed with understanding that whole relationship and its impact on American history. But I also was introduced in the eighth grade to John Hope Franklin. And I believe it was associated with his biography of growing up during the Tulsa riot. And he came to Savannah and he was to speak at the Telfair Museum. And the Telfair Museum was established in the early 1900s by Mary Telfair, who is who was a philanthropist. And all of my, you know, young life, I passed that um, that museum 
was struck by the statues out in front of it and always wanted to go in, but we were not, as an African-American, I was not allowed to visit that museum. But John Hope Franklin came to Savannah and I wanted to go hear his lecture. So I got the city bus to go hear John Hope Franklin. And I remember coming through the gates and being allowed to come in and being directed to the basement. The basement was where John Hope Franklin had to speak. As I got older, of course, and I went into the museum, there were other places for John Hope Franklin to have spoken. And there were other places that people spoke during that time. But John Hope Franklin was relegated to speaking in the basement because Blacks were not allowed into the museum. So I've, I've often wondered and still tried to research, how is it that he was allowed to speak there if we were not allowed to visit or not allowed to partake? Interestingly, when I returned, well, before I came back to Savannah, John Hope Franklin was on the Yale campus and I made my way up to him and I told him about him speaking in Savannah in the basement of that museum. And I said, if I ever go back to Savannah, which was not my plan at the time, I want to visit that space. And just in, in the memory of that moment that he and I had there together, when I came back to, came back to Savannah, I was invited to be on the board of the very museum that did not allow John Hope Franklin to speak in the main hall. And when they asked me if I would do it, and I'm, I was invited based on my position as superintendent, or actually at that point, I think chief academic officer, they asked if I'd ever had any experiences with the museum and I told them about that experience. And I said, because of that experience, I want to ensure that my board membership will be associated with increasing the outreach of this museum to everyone in this community, especially people of color, because it is all of us that made this museum what it is. And I want to ensure that no child ever has an experience like that again. I recognize the time that it occurred, but I did go on to ensure that the Telfair Museum opened its doors to families and was better engaged and more fully engaged with children beginning in pre-K. So pre-kindergarten, our children were coming into the museum and programs were planned to ensure that it was much more inclusive. And I am delighted that we've seen lots of growth and commitment to ensuring that the museum opens its arms to everyone. So I'm not sure if just my membership or that story made a difference on the board, but it was a sort of coming a full circle of making sure that all of our cultural entities recognize the contributions of every group that comes into an area. Thank you for that. One of the things that uh, I'm really intrigued by, and I don't know if it's totally unique, but it's certainly unusual, uh, is the Savannah Chatham County Public Schools owns and operates a museum. And I wonder if you could talk some about that because it really does embody the commitment to community as classroom that, that the school system has a museum, which I've been to, it's wonderful, and uses that in terms of teaching. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, about that part. Sure, it's the Massey Heritage Site. Um, Massey was a school that actually had its own interesting history um, and it is owned by the school district. We never closed it. It was at times used by the US Army um, for housing soldiers. It was a army hospital at one point, but it has primarily functioned as a school. 
It has definitely, um, as you experienced, we've expanded the way that that operates. So most kids in the early days um, would go into Massey um, and experience Massey as a recreation of a, you know, school from the 1800s or the early 1900s. Now it is not, that is an important part of what we do. So all of our students get an opportunity to go through the Mass C site. But we're also in that site showing how education started and has evolved in our area. There was a part of the history where Black students went to Massey that was completely unacknowledged, that is now fully acknowledged. So even the, the site itself has evolved. And we've also made it our job um, to ensure that everyone who comes through those doors understands the history of the Irish, the Native Americans, the Haitians, the Jewish people, everyone, and of course, African Americans and uh, Caucasians. So it is no longer just a place that kids come and see this kind of um, classroom from the 1800s, 1900s and ring the bell. No, it's a place that you come to hear about the rich history and the tapestry of Savannah, uh, Savannah and uh, the state of Georgia. I think it's a really good way of ensuring that people understand Savannah was not just, you know, I, we didn't just land there and everything was well from that point. It wasn't just English settlers. There were people from all around already here and those who came into the city. The Germans, we are now working on uh, the German history, the history of the Germans who lived in, in the in the Savannah area as well. But we are very excited to have the Massey Heritage Center and we invite anyone who comes into the city to have the opportunity to come through. It is also on our tour lines so that persons who are not looking necessarily to hear about the rich history of Savannah also have the opportunity to go there. Thank you for that. Uh, wanted to turn to the current moment. And again, I think you've got a particularly great window on the world and the challenges and opportunities we face. Professionally, you you have been a superintendent, still involved in superintendency with the National Association uh, uh, and, and with administrators. You've been a teacher, you've been a principal, you're a mother, you've had you know, kids go through schools, uh, you're a citizen. And we're in a very contested time, as we all know right now, just to your north in South Carolina, I was reading a story recently about a AP language teacher who assigned Ta-Nehisi Coates' The World in Me, and two of her students reported her, which I just find chilling that uh, students would have reported a teacher for uh, assigning something that, quote unquote, made them feel uncomfortable to be Caucasian. And that's in keeping with these laws that have been passed, these so-called memory laws sometimes uh, uh, against history that have been passed by state legislature. I think Georgia may have a, a law that is that. So I wonder to just reflect on, you know, on the on the front lines in Georgia, and it's not just Georgia, and uh, uh, nowhere in America is immune to these pressures. Uh, so reflect some on the difficulties, challenges of teaching real history in America in 2023, and maybe what you know keeps you uh going and as you as a as a as a leader uh encouraging your colleagues uh on the front lines in the classrooms to uh, do the hard work of teaching real history so reflect a little bit on the challenges and opportunities that we face in America in teaching history in 2023 well i think um thank you for the for that question i think it's so important for people to recognize that there are more than 19 states that have put into place language that you can't use, stories that you can't tell, facts that you can't share. It is it's absolutely absurd. And until we recognize that education, educating our children allows them to function well in a world that is 
very diverse, if they don't get the understanding that this is not anything new, these are things that have happened, they influence the, the, uh, some of the actions and practices that we have to have today, if they don't understand the history, they are, in someone's words, doomed to repeat it. We must teach them the truth. It is often painful, but it is awesome. It's also very often joyful because we learn about resistance. We learn about the evolution of things and how things have changed over time. I believe that as educators, pre-K 16, we must teach our children how to think and how to question, how to tell the difference between truth and propaganda. They must learn how to read, understand, ask questions, and to um, definitely just ask the question, why? Why was it that way? When we engage children in our own areas with the history in our own areas, the truth about the history in our own areas, it allows them to understand how far things have come and also allows them to investigate what made it, helped us make progress. How is it that we can be more accepting of people who are different from us? Um, so I think as educators, we have to stay the course. If we're going to, going to really prepare children for the future, we can't prepare them as if they live in a little blocks and block in Pleasantville. That's not how it works. The real world invites one to engage with people who may not be like them, but also to understand where we are, how we got there, and much and how much further, farther we have to go. When we can't use words like gay, you can't say um, diverse. Georgia says you can't say diverse. Like, I can't say diverse? It's just, it's unimaginable. It's destructive. And we have to rise up and just say, we're not gonna tolerate it. At the same time, we have to help teachers understand here are the things that allow us to ensure that children are growing and able to ask questions on their own that allow us to point them in the right direction. So it's a two-pronged effort. We must continue to advocate against those behaviors and vote out people who support those things. Uh, also getting really good candidates to represent us, staying vigilant in terms of our legislative work, but then also doing our work on the ground and that's making sure the teachers, students and parents understand the importance of teaching the real history. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm gonna do a program note and then return for, with a final question and, and a comment. So the program note is in the chat for everybody. Our next Mondays at Beinecke will be uh, with Paul Ciscoises, who is a Willow Cree, uh, activist, writer, and he's going to be talking about the Indigenous Archival Photo Project, particularly about a collection here at Beinecke, the Richard Erdos photographs, many of which are featured in our current show, Art Protests in the Archives. So I encourage everyone to um, come next week if you're able to live. Reminder that these are recorded and uh, published on our YouTube channel within a week or two generally, so you can share this talk with others uh, and also look back at others in the series. So final sort of note, and then I'll, I'll have a, 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 a simple question that you can run with and to close this out. Um, what you were just saying, I think was really important. All of what you said, the connections that you pointed out that we've talked about. I think it's very important for places like Yale, cities like New Haven to be in conversation with places like the Savannah, Chatham County Public Schools in Savannah, that we all get out of our own bubbles. And also realize, as you pointed out, there's a lot we can learn from each other. The similarities and the differences together make for a really good learning experience. And I wanted to uh, give uh, props to our colleagues at the Yale Gilder Lehrman Center, 
who forewent this year doing their own conference on campus and instead, and a shout out to David and Daisha and Michelle and Daniel and everybody at the Gilder Lehrman Center, they joined forces with Flagler uh, University, Flagler College down in St. Augustine in Florida and co-sponsored a conference in Florida about teaching history and teaching real history. And I thought that was a really good thing for them to do. And it's a good model for how we all should be, you know, crossing boundaries and building partnerships. And, and we're in very initial conversations of ways that we can informally for now, and maybe over time develop some bridges between New Haven and Savannah. And we're so blessed to have Anne as somebody who's got knowledge about both places. And I know she's gonna be up visiting with us in the not too distant future in person to continue these conversations, the Grimes story and the work that Regina Mason has done from her home in the West Coast is a story that unites Savannah and New Haven and that is a light to the nation and all the other different ways. So we're really excited about the possibilities. Um, but I wanted to close, if you could just share and a story, it can be your favorite story uh, or, or writer, but you know, in reading the, the future by the past, uh, what's a historic resource that you find yourself going back to that really gives you courage and confidence to uh, face the future? So, you know, that's a really good question, Michael. Um, I find, and this, this is not connected to New Haven in this way, but you know, one of the things that, one of the people that I greatly admired and wish I could meet her would be Zora Neale Hurston. And you know, the Meineke of course has a few of her pieces that are associated with her work with um, uh, Langston Hughes um, right there in the, in the collection. But Zora Neale Hurston is probably me at another time where she was a great anthropologist and really made lots of really strong connections, but her doggedness with getting to the truth was just unbelievable. And the late Valerie Boyd, who was a, an, um, an editor at the AJC, Atlanta Journal Constitution, wrote um, a book about Zora Neale Hurston called Wrapped in Rainbows. It just cataloged the doggedness of Zora Neale Hurston and her thirst and hunt for the truth. And I think if you read that book, if you haven't read it, you should read it. If you just read her story about how she was committed to learning the truth and sharing the truth, it's just incredible. Um, and I think it's a lesson for us all, a guidebook for us all. And I also think the other um, pieces that I love are written by Annette Gordon-Reed, of course, because of the session I have with Thomas Jefferson and uh, Sally Hemings, and the fact that her work, her doggedness, her commitment to understanding the real history made a change for the nation when it came to understanding Thomas Jefferson. So I think those are two pieces that I wish I were as smart as Annette, and I wish I was as smart as Valerie, and I wish I was as smart as Zora. I am not any of them, but I want to be able to help people understand that those three women were so committed to finding the truth, and they did. And I think we each should take a little piece of that and we'll make a difference in our world. We'll make a difference for our children. We'll make a difference for our country. Well, thank you for bringing Zora Neale Hurston into the space about her boy, Annette Gordon-Reed. And it's been such a joy to have, share space with you. I think people hopefully get an understanding of why you and I and, and our colleagues think that if one plus one can equal three or five or 10, Savannah and New, plus New Haven can equal uh, a multitude. So there's just so much we can learn with each other, from each other and learn together. It really has been uh, great to have you here today. And uh, if we're gonna read the future by the past, as I said, there are a few better guides than Dr. Ann Levette. Thanks for spending time with us today. Thanks everybody for joining us and hope to see many of you on future Mondays. Have a great day.